Hi, I'm potent writer Kay Spivey. About three years ago, I posted a video called Seven Mistakes New Poets Make, and it basically was just a well thought out, well meaning advice video for things that newer poets sometimes fall into the pitfalls of and things that you should avoid. And for years, that video really didn't get very much traction, but very, very recently, it has suddenly jumped up to one of my most viewed videos, which like, thanks guys. But also, it's been really weird getting sudden comments on that video. Some people have been taking it real personally. It apparently has offended many people, and I'm gonna link it up above. If you haven't watched that video, go ahead and watch it first because I worked really hard on it and it, I just rewatched it before making this one and it was pretty helpful, pretty nice. Some of the people obviously were just trolls who hadn't even watched the video and it's like, you can just say bye Felicia to all of those ones. But some of the people were very offended, like how dare you, who are you to tell me what to and to not do? And I was like, all right, what we really need here is a part two. This is gonna be seven more mistakes poets should avoid. And yeah, it's just poets this time. That's not just for for the newbies out there. This one though, whereas in the last one I was like, don't take this personally. No. If you're watching this and you're taking this personally, you should be because this this video is directly about you, stranger on the internet. Let's get into seven more mistakes that poets make. Number one is just randomizing your line breaks and punctuation. This is one of my biggest peeves and it marks you as a straight up amateur. Both line breaks and punctuation serve a purpose in poetry. Poems are short. Everything that goes into a poem needs to be part of the story of the poem. So if you have chosen to put in no punctuation whatsoever, that has to be a choice that is not only consistent throughout, but serves a purpose. If you've chosen to make your lines only two words long, that's gotta serve a purpose. And it also has to be consistent because if you suddenly have two words, two words, two words, and then three words, the three words is gonna stand out. Just the same as no punctuation, no punctuation, a period is gonna stand out. Darn well better that period must mean that everything above that was a continuous sentence. Because that's how language works. That's how people read. Everything you do needs to have a purpose. And you should understand that anything you then do which breaks the roadmap that you've set out, be it I have commas on the end of every line or I have no commas whatsoever, if you put one in, understand that is going to draw a lot of attention there. If you suddenly break a line in a totally different way, and I'm not talking about just like keeping with your meter, anything you do is going to draw attention. So make sure it's for a reason if you're going to do it. Think about, let's go back and think about Shakespeare. There's a reason that lovers in Shakespeare talk in sonnets. Sonnets were the poetry of love. And so it's to indicate something about this couple that right from the start, if you the audience are like, that's a sonnet, these are gonna be the end game couple. He made it easy for you. But anything you do like that, within for him the context of an entire play, if you're gonna put in this little, little part that's that's set up to be a poem, it's going to tell the reader something. And if it's not exactly what you want to be telling the reader, you've just made a mistake. You've just done something wrong. You shouldn't be making the reader fight you in order to read your poem. Number two is not practicing their craft. I'm not saying that you need to go to school for poetry. Most of us don't. And this isn't quite as simple as just reading widely. Reading widely is obviously the best advice for learning any any style of writing. It is the best thing you can possibly do to further your craft. However, poetry has some rules. You wouldn't just pick up an instrument and be like, I'm gonna go play in a symphony tomorrow. You wouldn't just pick up a paintbrush and be like, I will now make a painting and hang it in a museum. You learn things. There is practice that goes into every form of art and poetry can't be any different. Learning about the different styles of poetry. This could be this could be as simple as learning what is meter, what is scansion, what is metaphor. This could be as complex as who are the popular poets today and why. The more you learn, the better your poetry is going to be. If you refuse to learn, if you refuse to go out and maybe take a class, maybe read a book, practice is also important. Trying out a form, knowing that this is going to just stay in the notebook, never going to need to see the light of day, but maybe today I want to write a Sestina. 
that is good practice. It gets your mind working in a different way and is going to lead to better and more interesting poetry. And if you refuse to do that, just understanding that probably over time, your poetry is maybe not going to improve. Maybe it's going to get worse because you're suddenly confining yourself in this little bubble of like what your poetry is and you're not continuing to take in the things that makes poetry an art form in itself. Nobody in any other artistic practice would just be like, oh, I don't need to practice anymore. I'm an expert. I'm not going to practice anymore. I don't need to rehearse my dance number. I don't need to practice my instrument. I'm totally perfect at it and I'm just going to go without a rough draft and be fine. No one else does that. Like, come on. <laughs> Poets need to practice too. Number three is something I don't think I had encountered as much before this past year, but I encountered too much of it this last year, so I've really got to point it out. Poets explaining their poetry. I read a book that I know I've already reviewed on my channel, but I shall not name it here. We don't need to call anybody out. But within the published manuscript, there would be a poem and then a paragraph explaining what was going on in the poem. And I realized there's nothing more annoying than that. Partly because once you've published a poem, part of that is the reader's property now. Like if you wrote a poem about your brother and while I was reading it, I was like, whoa, my brother does the same thing. Well, now it's about my brother to me. And so I'm reading this poem being like my brother, like all of these things. And I'm like, yes, this is so uh, opening up my mind. What a great poem. And I come to the end and you're like, this only applies to my brother because he does this thing and this happened at this time and I'm writing about this specific thing. Well, the poem is ruined for me because that poem, I was gelling with you. <laughs> I was enjoying it. And now you've just said, no, you don't get this poem that I wrote and put in this book expecting you to read. No, it's only for me. I was like, well, then why did you publish it? And like, you can have it. Now it's put a bad taste in my mouth. You don't need to over explain. Now that's not to say that it's not interesting to like learn that, oh, I wrote this poem while I was studying abroad in Thailand. Like that's interesting. That's a cool context that might tell me a little bit more about why you chose certain things in the poem. There can be something interesting. But over explaining like the whys and the specific details, if your poem needs that, if you come to the end and feel like your poem needs that, you probably didn't write the poem well enough. Like the poem probably isn't done if you felt the need to explain in a paragraph at the end to me about what the poem was or what it was about. It probably just means the poem's not well written. Four goes along with that and that is to not leave the poem on the page. If you are publishing a poem and that's sending it out to a literary journal, putting it up on your website even, Although that's, that can be more personal and if you want it to be that and you explain that at the beginning, just understand people are going to approach it in a totally different manner than they would poems that are accessible and for everyone or publishing it in a book. Those poems have left the building. They no longer are your personal possession. They have to belong to the person reading them. That's part of the beauty of poetry is that person gets to experience those poems. And oftentimes, I'm not gonna say always, People do it very, very well, but sometimes a poem is too personal and too specific and you have not taken the time to remove yourself from it and place it at a safe enough distance that you can publish it in a way that it can be for someone else. There is a popularity to this very raw feeling of poetry, but I would say the times that the, those poems succeed the best is when the poet has understood that you are now receiving the poem and you are meant to get something from it and it's not all about the poet and their experience that they are allowing you more room to breathe they're allowing other things to happen there's a lot of nuance to what they're saying there's a lot of space for you to fit into the poem as the reader it is necessary in published poetry like there's a lot to be said for poetry being about you and about your experience and i think the book I'm thinking of that does this phenomenally is Fatima Asgard's If They Come For Us, where even though she is bringing you into her specific culture, 
she manages to be hugely accessible and extremely relatable. If you don't leave room for the reader in your poem, then why did you publish it in the first place? If it was meant to be that personal to you, isn't it best then to keep it personal to you? And sometimes I don't understand when poets feel the need to, for lack of a better phrase, air all their dirty laundry. And it does feel like who was the audience intended for this? Oftentimes I read poetry books that are like this, that are so deeply specific and personal. It's like, well, why was I supposed to read this? What was I meant to get out of this as the reader? I think I've mentioned again, I think it, I'm sure it was Jen Campbell who mentioned it. And I don't remember the exact phrase she used. <laughs> she was quoting someone else who had quoted to her about her book. But basically the, where am I as the reader supposed to exist in this book? Like the, you've given the book to me now, I'm supposed to be able to, ac to access it. And you have to allow that space for the reader to be part of the poem. So you need to leave the poem on the page and not insist on it being so personal to you, it isn't accessible to anybody else. And if that doesn't make sense, leave your very specific questions down below and I'll try and elaborate further. Number five is limiting a poem to doing only one thing. It can be done, but I would say that the style that does best the better way would be the haiku where you've got this teeny tiny little snippet. But if you have read a good haiku, they do so much in those tiny amount of words. They bring in such a strong emotion and such a very specific scene. Like if a poem is only a snapshot, like a still life, it could be a really good one, but it probably isn't going to be something that really sticks in the mind. It isn't gonna be something that's somebody's favorite poem. Poetry can do more things. A poem could have a still life in it and be reflecting on something emotional that somehow is connected into that. Like a very strong image can come with some real serious commentary. Recently, the rise of Insta poetry has had more poems doing more of one thing where they're like, here is a bit of advice or here is just an affirmation. A poem can do more than that. A poem can reflect on many, many things at the same time. Limiting yourself to your poem only being one thing, only doing one thing. If you're a newer poet, this is something you should really explore. How much can I stuff in here? Could be an interesting exercise, but at the same time, what am I showing with the poem and what am I saying with the poem can and I think should be two different things. Number six, getting stuck in the same niche. And I think that this happens to poets, especially when they gain some fame with something. So it isn't something that usually newer poets will fall into or lesser known poets where we're still experimenting, we're still willing to experiment, we're still willing to change and to mimic. But sometimes a poet will become very well known for something and they will feel like they can't break away from that or grow and change or pursue the similar thing in a different way or maybe a totally different thing. It can become stagnant. If you fit too deeply into a niche, you'll come upon a time where eventually it'll feel like you've just stagnated, like you're not learning and growing, your poetry has become very samey, samey, samey. You start having poems that sort of reach or almost become satirical, even though they might not have intended to be that way. Billy Collins is coming to mind where some of his like cleverness in some of his more recent poems is a little bit less clever and maybe even satirical or tongue in cheek and a little bit more just like, ooh, cringe. This is why continuing to learn is so important, especially if you have some success in one style, continuing to learn and to see and to grow because guaranteed someone is gonna come along and do your style better than you. And if you're still doing your old style and this person has far and away exceeded what you were able to do, well, everyone's gonna be reading them now. And number seven is to not take everything so seriously. <laughs> All the poets or maybe not poets who came to my previous seven things video and got their panties in a twist, don't take everything so seriously. Honestly, poetry can be many things. And for the most part, I'm talking about poetry as in 
you've written it, you've published it in some form and you expect someone else to read it. You can write for yourself genuinely however you want. If the only way you want to write for yourself is to write lists, that's cool. Publishing an entire book of lists you better have something to say with that. When you move to the step of publishing, there are other expectations, there are other rules, and if you're going to undermine them, you need to do them in a thoughtful, meaningful way. But if you're just writing for yourself, it's okay. You can do whatever you want. There is a lot of room to do more things. Just don't take it so seriously. Very few people are out here on the internet trying to cause you personal harm. Things can hurt if you're like, oh, but I fall into that in anything. You and I are strangers. <laughs> I'm not talking to you directly. It feels like I am, but I'm not. Nobody who's giving any kind of writing advice is talking to you directly. However, just because we're not having a one-on-one -on -one dialogue and conversation doesn't mean that someone talking to you in this manner doesn't necessarily have something to say or something to teach you. Especially when it comes to writing and learning about writing. There's a lot that can be learned from other writers who have been through things. There's a lot to be learned from other poets who have published or poets who are publishing or people who have studied poetry. There's a lot to learn and there are a lot of different avenues and if something upsets you, totally okay, but also back off. Think about why. Are they right? Does it hurt because it's true? Because I've been there. I've been there so many times. Sometimes someone will say something that just cuts through the heart and you need to go have a cry about it. But maybe that cry is a healthy cry and maybe that cry can lend to some poetry. For sure, some of the greatest poems I've ever written have been me being snarky and mad at somebody and being like, well, I can do this thing that you told me I couldn't do that told me that that wasn't the right way to write. I'll write it and show you. Vindictive writing is great. It's good for the soul. Comes out with phenomenal poems, I must say. Really, really good poems come from being really angry, especially at my teachers. And I want to twofold that in that poetry doesn't all have to be serious. A lot of really popular poems today are pretty serious. A lot of poetry that's been really popular throughout time has been serious, but not all of it. There are fun poems too, and you can write poetry for fun, and you can write fun poems. There should be more fun poems out there in the world. There are niches that you can fit into for many, many, many things. Just don't limit yourself and keep learning. At the end of the day, that's what's really important, is that poetry continues to be this give and take thing where we use language and structure to express ourselves in ways that other forms just can't or won't. That's all I have for you today. Please feel free to leave a comment down below and definitely check out my previous video, Seven Mistakes New Writers Make. I will talk to you again soon. Lots of good vibes to you and Good luck to you. Bye.